Thank you for watching Taxpayer Alert. I'm Al Segala. I'll be your moderator. I'm also president of the Calaveras County Taxpayer Association, who's always interested in getting to the truth of what's going on in government. And we have a series of interviews with, with people in the know, key people in government, that tell us what's really going on so we can know what's going on and feel more comfortable with our government, or not. In any case, we have our assessor, Leslie Davis. Leslie, welcome. Hello, Al. How are you tonight? Just wonderful, and it's so cool in here, we don't want to go back outside. <laughs> so much better than outside. Well, Leslie, give a little bit of background about yourself for people who may not uh, know you. Okay. I've been in the assessment world or the appraisal world for most of the last three and a half decades. I came up to Calaveras County in 2000 and have been working at the Calaveras County Assessor's Office ever since. I've been acting as the assessor for more than seven and a half years now. And it occurred to me just a month ago in a department head meeting, I'm now the longest standing department head in the county. You're the person that knows what's going on. Well, I might know where some of the skeletons are hidden, <laughs> but I don't know where everything <laughs> is that's going on. I have to mention that over the years, you've been our guest several times in our taxpayer alert, and you've been uh, bent over backwards to keep people informed. And this is, this is really, uh, really good. It's part of a sunshine process, which all governments should really be doing. Well, thank and, you for that, Al. I yeah. really think it's important that the public understand what we're doing and, and be told what we're doing, because it, government is not good in the dark. Yes, and, and, and it seems to be at its best when the sun is shining. Absolutely. <laughs> the, uh, so uh, now you've had some unusual circumstances. You've had this uh, fire that, uh, <clears throat> that really upset our, uh, county government quite a bit, uh, not only your department, but other departments as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then on top of that, you need to uh, do readjustments on values of uh, these properties that are that have uh, been damaged. Absolutely. And, and then you have time frames that the state imposes on you to do this, and you have to follow that. And at the same time, you have to follow as best you can the needs of the public to to have their their uh, reevaluation of their properties. Is that in a nutshell? That's a that's <laughs> a, a pretty good summary of what we're facing. It's been uh, an incredibly challenging year this past year. We have, because of our staffing levels, we have been building a backlog of work so that every year when we used to be done, uh, we still have work that we needed to get finished that wasn't finished. This year, we were just finishing up that backlog when the Butte fire erupted. Oh, no. And, of course, the those who were affected immediately by the Butte fire really needed our immediate attention. Right. We couldn't possibly know how long that was going to take. We put all hands on deck starting in late September. Uh, we still have about 10 percent of those properties yet to adjust in terms of their assessed value. So we really haven't finished that. And the downstream effect is on everyone else. So anyone who has had a change of ownership or new construction that we should have gotten to a value, we haven't been able to get to most of those. And now our backlog is roughly eight times what it was last year. Before the fire. Before the fire. At the same time, as you know, uh, we went through a little market adjustment here about six, seven, eight years ago. And so we've had a number of properties in what we call a decline of value status. And what that means in simple terms is their current market value is less than the factor base your value, which is that you call protected Prop 13 value. Right. So those had to be adjusted downward. And they should be looked at every year. Right. But because of the Butte fire analysis, because of how far behind we were, we were not able to look at those properties this year. So there's good news and bad news associated right. with that. The 14,836 properties in that status are going to see their assessment flat this year. In other words, whatever it was last year, it's going to be the same this year because we didn't get to that analysis. But if the market improves next year, then we will be capturing all of that increase in a one-year jump. There, there, we've discovered something with the fire that there's, uh, there's been a, uh, a huge industry in our county with cannabis. 
uh, and um, and because of the seclusion of their operation and the fact that they're a quasi, I guess, black market, uh, they deal on a cash basis. Nobody really knew how much was going on, but now it looks like there's a huge amount, uh, millions and millions of dollars, and the county has received, I think, $3.7 million just in, in uh, application fees or permit fees from uh, commercial cannabis growers. And I think they're between the, the commercial and the and then the uh, private uh, growers. Uh, there's like over 900 of them. Now into this into this boiling mix, uh, there's questions about property values. If uh, a property is really in commercial use, producing millions of dollars, but it's not zoned commercial, it's zoned uh, agricultural or maybe residential of some maybe R20 or or something else. Does does this uh, this amount of money that's going on have, have any effect on value, on appraisals, or on, on on your work? Well, it is going to have an effect on our work because what we've seen is an increase in the number of sales right. throughout the county, and that's because the board opened the county for cannabis growers right. uh, who could meet the requirements of the regulation. Uh, in terms of what it does to assess values. Now, that's an interesting analysis. <laughs> um, as those properties change hands, they are, of course, reassessed right. at their acquisition-based pricing. And so we're seeing a little change in the market as a result of that. If somebody who, let's just pretend you and I, had owned a piece of property for, for 20 years and now we've decided we're going to grow cannabis, we still get that protected base year value. Right. So that is not going to change because we've decided to put a different crop. Right. But if there's new construction, if we put greenhouses up, if we put a water irrigation system, then my office is naturally going to assess that new construction. Remember that when Prop 13 passed and created Article 13A of the Constitution, it said all property has a base year value unless it has a change in ownership or new construction. Right. Now, in terms of the cannabis crop itself, this is a question I get asked quite a bit. How do you assess a cannabis crop? The fact is we do not assess the cannabis crop. And the reason is, is it's not a crop that would be assessed. It's an annual crop, like tomatoes or basil or corn. So that crop is not assessable, like a vine or a tree. Right. So in terms of what they're growing or how much they're growing, that would not be anything my office would be tracking. Um, you mentioned a vine or tree. Well, that could mean grapevines. Yes, grapevines and orchards, like walnut orchards or olive orchards. Okay. Those are assessed. All right, and of course they're appraised uh, <clears throat> according to what they produce, probably, Correct. for the value. Yes. Okay, I understand. <clears throat> also, I understand that uh, uh, my experience as a real estate broker, I, I uh, found that the, it's only certain properties that the uh, cannabis growers want to uh, buy, and their criteria is, is uh, seclusion, uh, size, they've got to have so many acres, and water availability. Now, it just so happens there's not that many properties that really fit that mold so well, so that means that those particular properties will well, well, they have been selling for above listed price. But other properties that don't have those characteristics are, <laughs> are back in the same market. They're not drawn, their values are not drawn up because their neighbor has some particular characteristics. Also, I noticed that, uh, I'm sharing something that beyond the, our, our guess, um, I, I noticed that the, uh, the number of inquiries for property has dropped off sharply after um, May 10th, when the new regulations went in, sure. So those peaks in, uh, in fighting of escrows and and, um, and bidding of properties seem to stop at that point. And we'll see what happens as we go along to a point where they're going to have permanent regulations. And it is so complex because there's so many different things that are uh, that are happening in the way of of, um, of referendums and state. Uh, a state, a state uh, possible referendum that uh, we just don't know a year from now how the dust is going to settle. 
Well, that's absolutely true, and those all of those complications factor into any appraisal of property. You know, you, you and I, when we were learning about how property was valued, we were taught that the three most important things in real estate were location, location, location. Yeah. And of course, the first thing you mentioned was seclusion. Right. Uh, I think what you might begin to see in the area, and this regulation affects the entire county, a lot of people think it's somehow restricted to the fire perimeter, but that's yes, not uh, the case. I think what we're going to find is seclusion may become less important than being in an area where there are other cannabis cultivators, because the reason for seclusion initially was to not be obvious. Right. But now that it's allowed, Right. Now that it's being regulated, being around others who are similarly cultivating right. will make it a little bit easier for the neighborhood to trade um, information on irrigation or fertilizer or soils and, and those types of things. And security services for the time of harvest. And that may be too. <laughs> And that may be too. So I, I think we're going to see a uh, change from that seclusion criteria. Right. Obviously, anytime you're growing something, soil type and water availability are two key components. Right. Uh, understood. So now we're moving uh, uh, to uh, you close the rule. Is that right? We have. We've oh. closed the 2016 rule. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Now, you, you have a constant uh, struggle in, in getting employees to, uh, would, you know, I understand that you have a shortfall and employees where you need actually more to be able to get caught up quicker. Absolutely, Al. Um, and, and I like to go back to before the recession. Before the recession and the county's budget tightening um, and all the changes we had to make to the budget, my office had 20 or 21 full-time people. As of today, I have 13 budgeted positions. Four of those are currently vacant for a number of reasons. And I think if you look at how this last year has played out and the stress that's been on my staff, it certainly becomes more explainable why we have so many vacancies right now. We are 50% down on our appraisers. We are 25% down on our assessment technicians. And I don't have a mapping staff. So we're in full recruitment mode for the entire spectrum of the office staff. And the other piece that makes it difficult to recruit, in fact, I can talk about something that happened today. I'll do it in very vague terms because I don't want to violate confidentiality. But as a taxpayers association, I know you might have a little problem that might give us a little debate. The county's salary schedule is so low that it's very difficult to attract employees and keep them. Right. Uh, the last employee who I had who left, she left for a position with another organization. She got about a 60% salary increase by leaving Calaveras County employment and going there. That's awesome. It's awesome for her. It's impossible for us right. to compete with. And so, um, I, although I think I have absolutely the best possible staff, it is hard to attract people of that caliber right. when the salaries are so very low. So as part of my budget memo this year, I told the Board of Supervisors that they needed to begin to look at the salaries that Calaveras County is paying. The entry level lowest position in my office is about $15.68 an hour. So when you hear the conversation about the minimum wage being raised to $15, you know, if you can make $15 an hour asking if you want fries with that, or $15 an hour in a very stressful position, right. I think you're going to go to the fast food restaurant. And also, practically all your people have to have special training because it's not like a normal office. I don't mean normal office. I mean, it's not like a, a business office. Uh, you can't take somebody from a, uh, from another organization, put them in the assessor's office because you have so many uh, so many different rules uh, and that it takes a while to learn the rules. That's absolutely true, Alan. As you know, this year. I went to the board in January and asked them to opt in to the new state requirement that all of my staff be certified. Right. Until this past year, 
uh, the only employees who needed to be certified were the appraisers. So they needed to be certified, they needed to pass a, a test saying they understood the basics. And then there's a required for conti requirement for continuing education. This past year, the California Assessors Association sponsored a bill that I wrote, so I'm, I'm very happy with it. Good for you. <laughs> um, to require certification of the balance of the staff right. who works in change in ownership decisions and exemption decisions. Right. And what's important is that those decisions have major effect on people's lives right. and they have a major effect on the county assessment role. Right. So it's important for those staff members to be knowledgeable, to have continuing education, and to rise to a level of competence that we have come to expect. But I think the public across the state should have that same expectation. Is there, has there been a study made comparing the different similar counties to ours uh, as to uh, what the salaries are so we could see how we are, whether we're below uh, average or if we're above? or do, Has that been done? Well, occasionally we do uh, perform those studies. Usually it's when things get really bad, like the, the problems we're having now. I made a job offer to someone just this week, and he called and said, I'm sorry, the private sector uh, employer I've been talking to has made me an offer I just simply can't refuse. So our competition isn't really with other counties. Although there is competition with other counties, I, I know that... assessment work. Absolutely. I know that Amador County uh, assessor's office pays some of their beginning level staff members about three dollars an hour more than we pay our beginning level staff members. But the key here is this. If we do a survey of surrounding counties and the surrounding counties do a survey of surrounding counties, we tend to keep each other down. The competition isn't necessarily with these surrounding counties. I have lost people to Stanislaus County, which really is close but it's not close enough to right. commute comfortably. Right. There are 58 counties in this state. I could lose my people to any one of the 58, and obviously where I'm losing them now is to the private sector. Okay, so then there needs to be a study of comparable um, uh, salaries in the private sector. And I think that um, that push is being made. I don't know what will happen at the board level. I haven't. I have been told that there's not a lot of uh, energy around that, not a lot of support for that, but I think it's absolutely critical that our staff is paid a fair wage. Right. So if they leave, it's not because they're underpaid. Exactly. That would be my preference. Okay. I'd rather that they're mad at me. So, <laughs> well, they, they do that sometimes. They do. <laughs> Especially if you don't bring in enough tax money. There you go. <laughs> Especially the politicians. <laughs> they don't like an assessor that doesn't bring a lot of money. Yeah. Okay. Now, all right. So, we we have a situation where it looks like a, there's a study needs to be made, so it's clear what the problem is. And it won't be clear unless there's a study. That's the way government people think. So, that <laughs> And yet we know. We have this <laughs> anecdotal evidence that is telling us exactly what we already know. No. And then, of course, um, building on that government doesn't move without a study. Government also doesn't move quickly. Right. So there has to be a strategy in place. Uh, what they're going to find is that the current salary levels, they're not only compacted so much that there's no incentive to improve your skills and move forward, um, but there's also the problem with the salaries being too low. So what the county will then have to do is establish a schedule to try and pull that salary schedule up. Right. So that the higher ranking employees start to move up higher, which allows the lower ranking employees room to grow. Right. So it needs to be structured. And that now, will take them a while to figure out how they're going to do that financially because of the competing uh, requests that are always made every year at budget. Right. Um, now, wouldn't uh, the human uh, resources uh, department be able to make such studies? 
They should be able to, although Rebecca Kellen and I have discussed the fact that there is money in Teeter that could be used to hire a consultant to do that. Uh, one of the problems that we talked about moments ago was my staffing levels. Yeah. I'm not the only department who experiences staffing levels in right now. You don't have staff to do a study. That's true. And HR is in a similar kind of situation in that they just lost one of their staff members. So if we have the funds available to hire a consultant to do it, why aren't we doing that? Why not, yeah, not just your department. Right. Why not hire a uh, consultant look the whole county? Exactly. And, and uh, get a clear picture of what's happening in regards to salaries in competition with the private sector and mm -hmm. the other counties. Correct. That makes sense? It does. Okay. So but we make sense. Okay, that you heard that first happen. on Taxpayer Alert. <laughs> 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 well, that's, uh, that's good. Um, maybe... Uh, we need to have Rebecca on here again, and uh, and maybe uh, human uh, human resources. There you go. Um, okay, the next uh, funding is is a problem, of course, and <clears throat> that may be not the main problem, but uh, the the board of supervisors needs to look at the overall budget and consider which is high priority. They need to prioritize. Sometimes they don't. But they you know, I think they're very clear on their priorities. Okay. I, I think their priorities have been books and bullets. And I think Chris Wright's the one who coined that phrase. He said he didn't want to fund anything but the sheriff's office and the library. For the most part, the sheriff's office has been very articulate in expressing their needs. They right. have been able to garner tremendous public support about supporting the sheriff's budget to increase his staffing. You know, Al, I'm, I'm, I've been in this business a lot of years, and I know that people don't love to see the assessor walk in the room. They certainly don't love to see the assessor knock on their door. So there's not going to be a hue and cry to increase our department. But if our department isn't adequately funded, then the tax base that funds the sheriff's office and the tax base that funds the right. library it begins to falter and I think that's what we're seeing is we're seeing several years of budget decisions that favors the departments who are spending the money and not favoring the department that's bringing it in. So it's short-sighted to hamper getting your money. I, I think <laughs> it's bad business. <laughs> All right so uh, the the key departments, of course, is law enforcement is, if, if the purpose of government is to protect the rights of life, liberty, and property, then the number one uh, protector is, is law enforcement. Correct. Um, without that, we have to rely on self-defense and vigilantes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that doesn't bring about good business. Correct. So uh, the key departments would be the the assessor that essentially brings in money from property taxes, the uh, uh, the clerk recorder, who without their work we wouldn't have property transfers that are smooth, and they would be problems. Mm -hmm. The attorneys would have a field day, and uh, and it'd be very difficult to get financing. And be just without having a, a county clerk recorder, so that's really key. Those, those uh, the assessor, the the sheriff, and the uh, county recorder, and of course the tax collector. If the tax collector didn't collect the taxes, they wouldn't have the money. True. So now, where's low on the totem pole? Well, too bad. It might be books. <laughs> we may have well, to go to the internet. I mean, one of the things we know in terms of growing an economy is that you want an educated workforce. Right. So when you think about libraries, you think about that educated workforce. It helps. We, we can't downgrade or dismiss departments because they don't contribute to one of those key functions. There right. is a very real purpose for libraries. And when libraries are well-funded, communities grow. 
communities are more prosperous. That leads to higher assessed values. This is all a give and take. I can tell you about the symbiotic relationship between my department and every other department at the county, save maybe one or two. So it, you know, it's a very bad system that we have in terms of budgeting, where we're throwing everybody into an arena like the gladiators in ancient Rome, and we're hoping the lion goes after them. <laughs> That's essentially how we have been doing budgeting in, at, at the county level. What we need to do is establish priorities and begin to understand that if you want to fund law enforcement, if you mm -hmm. want to go out and get those grants that you love so much with the strings attached, with the need for matching funds, right. then you better fund the departments that are generating that money, collecting that money, and allocating that money, right. or that are uh, creating the, issuing the building permits or accepting the recorded documents because all of that flows to my department. Right. Oh, what a, what a headache. It is. I don't, apparently there's not simple solutions. There are never simple solutions. <laughs> well, it does seem to be a, a solution to do a, uh, to get the facts about comparative salaries because losing people because you're not paying them enough, there's no excuse for that. I agree. But uh, as for, we can't ban books because we need the books <laughs> in order to have the brains. We need the brains in order to uh, have prosperity. So um, there, there doesn't seem to be uh, a particular function of government that I could think of right now that, well, I'll take that back. You could privatize the building department. And some counties, some communities do that. I don't know if they save money or not. I don't either. <laughs> but then. That's, uh, that's interesting. We had a discussion on solid waste with uh, uh, our former guests, and uh, one of the things that they're looking at is uh, what, can, what can the private sector do better? Mm -hmm. And uh, we had dinner vacation uh, in uh, uh, south of Tuolumne, uh, a water district uh, that uh, decided to sell the whole district to, uh, to a company that's nationwide, mm -hmm. or is, is considering doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, because they couldn't seem to manage it as well as the private company could. So maybe part of the solution might be finding ways to contract out, privatize. I don't think you can do it with assess the assessment because it's, it's too unique. Well, it's more than unique. There are so many legal requirements around confidentiality and how private contractors would interact with the department right. that it's really not, um, it, it's not cost effective. It's really difficult to administer properly. Well, the, the, uh, we have new certification requirements and a minute left. <laughs> well, I'll tell you in a minute, we can't cover it, but we've already covered new certification requirements. That's the requirement that my non-appraisal staff be certified. Oh, okay. So see, we did that in less than 30 seconds. Well, that's good. You know, the, uh, I, I sometimes wonder how you can do all this. I know I couldn't do it, and I don't know many people that could. There's just so many details in what you're doing. Well, thank you. That's a great compliment, but I couldn't do it without a really good staff. Yeah. And that's why it's so very important to retain that staff, to recruit really good people, and to keep them. Thanks Leslie for having Davis. me, Al. <laughs> Thank you for watching Taxpayer Alert. Watch us next time. You'll always be informed. <laughs>